very happy to be here and talk to you guys. Um, so I put this uh, set of slides together this afternoon, um, basically to describe some of the, uh, uh, the co-design in terms of hardware software co-design for networking that we've been doing at Sandia for about the last 20 years. Um, so I put all these slides together, um, went through them. I was fairly happy that I was going to tell you guys something interesting and you know, keep your attention, uh, somewhat inspire you maybe. I don't know. Uh, and then I went and looked at Ken Raffinetti's slides from yesterday, and I was like, um, <laughs> Ken and I uh, have some overlap. Uh, I think we're consistent, so that's good. Um, but I'll just have to concentrate on some other parts of, uh, of the talk that I was going give, to give you. So um, I think Ken, Ken mentioned briefly the portals uh, API work that we've done at Sandia um, over the last 20 plus years. Uh, so I've been at Sandia, I'll uh, be 23 years in October. Um, so uh, I have a little bit of history here to motivate some of the stuff that we've done, some description of, of the things that are, we think are important in terms of networking, uh, and then a little bit of the future stuff, which uh, is, is fairly interesting that I'm going to touch on. So the, the Portal's um, API, this, this uh, low-level network programming interface that we have, is really kind of our research vehicle for doing co-design. Um, and co-design is a somewhat loaded term. Um, here we're actually talking about how we can manipulate the hardware and the software together to do something. Uh, for example, if you look at the co-design centers in ECP, uh, from my perspective, there's no hardware there. They're really co-designing software in interfaces more than they are doing hardware software co-design. Um, so portals is something that was essentially part of our, our uh, lightweight operating system work, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the early 90s on our massively parallel processing machines at Sandia. Um, it started out as, as part of our, our lightweight kernel operating system. We extracted it out as an API later, and I'll go into a little bit of that. Um, and it's been fairly successful in having some impact on uh, the way interconnect hardware is designed and deployed. Um, so I listed there some of the uh, features that we're trying to get um, in terms of uh, capabilities for the network programming layer, and I'll mention uh, some more of those as we go along. Back when I started at Sandia, um, we had a, uh, I think the largest Intel Paragon that had ever been deployed. Um, there was a big one at Oak Ridge and there was a big one at Sandia. Um, and so I went and stole this product data sheet from Intel off the web that describes what the Intel Paragon is. And the section I've highlighted um, is essentially the, the part that describes the, the node of an Intel Paragon had two I-860 processors on it. One of those was meant to be compute and one of those was meant to be for networking. And, and the marketing, all of the slide, you know, all of the manuals that came with the machine emphasized that one processor was for message passing and networking, and one processor was for compute. No one would ever sell you a machine today <laughs> where they say you have to use half of the processors to actually do networking. <laughs> so this is an interesting perspective, but but this was an emphasis of these early MPP machines, which is in some ways, the compute is as important as the network is. You have to have network performance in order to, in order to get MPP machines to scale. Um, so I thought this was interesting. So when I started at Sandia, this is what we had. We had a large 1800 node Paragon. The group that I joined was essentially writing an operating system, a compute node operating system, to replace the operating system that Intel uh, had deployed because there were some scalability and performance issues with it. Um, that followed into the Intel ASCII Red what Intel called their T-Flops machine because it was the first teraflops machine. Uh, so December 1996, uh, up in, uh, Gre up in, what was the, it's in Beaverton. I was gonna, I was gonna give you the, the room that it was in. I can't remember now. Cornell Oaks. Cornell Oaks. Thank you, Tim. Um, and this is what a compute node of, of uh, the T-Flops machine looked like. So it, it basically had, this is a board uh, with two uh, Pentium Pros on it, uh, actually uh, two per node, uh, the NIC directly cr connected to the memory bus. Um, so this was kind of the MPP architecture that we were dealing with. Um, the interesting thing about our lightweight operating system, again, it controlled the network. Um, so if you look at, at the way the network actually worked, the network interface controller was attached to the memory bus. It was coherent with the processors because they were all on the memory bus, so anything that you did in terms of network transfers was, was cache coherent with the processors. Um, you essentially program DMA engines and, and registers inside the operating system to make things on the network go. Um, it was interrupt driven. Uh, so uh, essentially when a, when a message would arrive at the, at the node, at the destination node, it would uh, flag an interrupt that was handled by the OS. The OS would then consume the, the message off of the network 
um, when and, and program the DMA engines to do that. When the tail came of the message came in, then it would generate another interrupt. Um, and in order to initiate a message, you would trap into the OS. You would program the DMA engines appropriately and let it go. Um, and then when the, when the uh, tail of that message actually went out, then you got another interrupt. Um, so this was actually a, a really nice setup to be able to do interesting research on the way you should structure networking for MPP machines. Um, so at this time, again, this is 1993. This is before MPI had been standardized. Um, there was a lot of work on MPP machines about the right way to do message passing and networking. And so our OS was essentially started as a way to explore the different ways that you could uh, do networking functionality for this. Um, the good thing about the way the network was set up and the fact that it was interrupt driven was that we could focus on things like how to do overlap. Um, because you could always uh, start a message and go back to computing. If you wanted to dedicate that, that processor to uh, that second processor to message coprocessing, you could have it dedicated to handling those interrupts and do things like that. But our operating system actually did um, uh, use both processors to do compute. And then we could interrupt one, uh, but have non-blocking so that you could actually overlap. Um, the network is a little bit different than today's networks. I don't know if Ken went into this level of details, but it was actually source routed and circuit switched, which meant that the entire message went through the machine at once. So it wasn't packetized. Um, the header, essentially, uh, when, when the node went to send a message, you filled in the destination information, the routing information, because it was source routed. That route got consumed along the way, and so it would either pull bytes off or, or ship bits in order to get to the destination. But once you started a header, all of the data flowed after that until it got to the tail. And so if you could visualize the way the network worked, you would have these essentially worms of messages uh, entirely floating around the machine. Um, but it was a very cool network to do things on. We had some basic assumptions about the way we thought the network should work for MPP machines. So uh, one of the things that we needed was a single low-level networking API. Because we were writing a compute node operating system that didn't have a TCP stack in it, everything ended up being a message. So not only was the application sending messages for the, the parallel application to communicate, but the operating system had to send messages too in some way. Because things like um, system calls that weren't supported by the local OS had to be offloaded to something that could handle those system calls. And so you had to have an RPC or remote procedure call library that would use it, uh, use the network. You had uh, things like I.O. went over the network as well. And so we wanted one sort of low-level networking layer that would meet all of those upper layer of protocol requirements. Um, we assume the system is space shared. That's still true today for most large-scale MPP-like machines and clusters. Um, that basically meant that the node owned all of the networking resources. So we weren't trying to timeshare. We weren't trying to share the network resources. Uh, we were trying to dedicate as, many as, as much of the resources as, as possible to the application. Um, we expected applications to be able to use multiple protocols simultaneously. So even though if you were writing an MPI application, you were using MPI, we also, again, expected I.O., remote procedure calls, Shmem, Cray Shmem's API was also supported on ASCII Red. Um, all of those protocols would have to be supported by that low-level low networking layer and be used at once. Um, so we couldn't just focus on, M on MPI. We needed to provide enough support to make MPI scale and be performant, but we couldn't make that just the thing that the network uh, focused on. Um, things like supporting communication between un unrelated processes. Again, if you're doing things like I.O., where you're talking to I.O. servers, from a, a Unix permissions perspective, you don't own uh, a process, but you still need to be able to talk to it. Um, and then we always assumed that interconnect hardware limitations couldn't be fixed in software. Uh, and so we were trying to exploit as much of the interconnect hardware as possible. So we looked at things like independent progress. Um, so this is the idea. So you guys got uh, a whole bunch of uh, MPI information today, didn't you? Uh, did you guys talk about progress and MPI at all? A little bit? OK. So this is the idea that if you post a receive and go away and do something, and then the send comes in that matches that, you don't have to call back into the MPI library to actually make that, that send complete. Um, and so there, there are uh, multiple implementation, uh, multiple um, at the time MPI 1 came out, there were some different interpretations of whether you had strong progress or weak progress. Uh, and the thing that we were trying to do with portals was provide strong progress so that you could essentially enable overlap and get all the benefits of, of being able to post or receive and go away and know that the data would still get transferred. Um, overlap, 
Uh, we only, not only wanted to support the ability to overlap computation with communication, but also communication with communication. So if you had a large I.O. transfer that was going out to the parallel file system and you wanted to send a message, you could do that as well. Um, that gets a little bit tricky on a wormhole routed network, um, but it was something that we, we supported. Um, scalable use of memory resources is still potentially an issue for MPI. So this was an issue 20 years ago when we had you know, basically a 2,000 node machine. It's still an issue today. How do you make sure that the resources that you're using for things like MPI, where you have unexpected messages, you have buffering in the network, um, you potentially have connections, how do you make sure that your resources don't scale to some proportion of the machine that's going to consume all the resources at its largest scale? And so we tried to focus on providing a, a low-level networking API that would not scale with that would scale with the communication usage of the network and not necessarily anything that was arbitrary, like the number of ranks that you were using or the number of nodes or the number of peers that you were going to talk to. Um, and then, of course, we wanted high performance. And so we tried to focus on things that would provide high bandwidth, low latency, um, and to some extent, high message rate as well. Um, so we had some philosophies that we looked at um, when we were trying to develop this low-level API. If you look at all of the, most of the, the network models that, that are used in parallel computing, they're all connectionless. So MPI, once you get MPI com world, you can talk to anybody. Any rank can talk to any other rank. If you look at the Crash Mem API, same thing. They're all fully connected. And so if you're trying to worry about scalability and you don't want to scale resources up um, with the number of peers that you're talking to, connectionless is, is, makes a lot of sense. Um, and again, it's easy to build connections over a connectionless under straight, under, underneath you. Um, it's harder to do, almost impossible to do the other way around. Uh, we looked at one-sided as, as the most efficient way to deliver data. Um, if you're, again, if you're looking at MPI point to point where you're two-sided, you can build two-sided protocols on top of one-sided. You can't really do it the other way around. Um, we knew we needed matching at the lowest layer as well, because in order to enable independent progress and strong progress for MPI, you have to do matching at the network layer. You can't throw messages into user space and let the application do the messaging, because that sort of doesn't provide independent progress for you. Um, and we thought offload uh, was a key way to get that. So this is offloading the, the matching semantics and the responsibility of moving data away from the application onto the network layer. Now, that network layer could be implemented in a, in a couple of different ways. You could do it uh, through hardware or not, but we knew that the semantics of, of getting uh, an, offload, uh, an offload semantic was really important. Um, and then progress, which I already talked about. Um, so Ken covered this a little bit in his talk. Uh, the difference between kernel-level networking and user-level networking. Um, so kernel-level networking is pretty much the, the thing that you get with sockets where there's a lot of memory copies. Uh, the network device essentially dumps stuff into kernel space. The kernel waits for you to ask for it through a read or write system call uh, and then copies data around. Uh, the good thing about um, kernel-level networking is it actually uh, allows you to tie your transfers into the scheduler, if you think about this. And this is one of the issues that we still have in high-performance networking. Um, when you create a socket and you, you call the, um, the select poll um, or the SIG action, you can actually, uh, you can say, wake me up, wake this process up when, when data arrives. And because everything is going through the kernel, the kernel can wake that process up. And so you can be very efficient about how you schedule things to run on cores if you know that you're going to be woken up by the OS when, when messages arrive. Um, the contrast to that is user level networking. Um, where everything goes directly from the NIC to user space. And there's no mechanism, there are really very few mechanisms for scheduling when you wake up. Um, some processors now have the ability to uh, put a thread to sleep, and when a memory location gets written, either by another thread or by the OS or by the network, it will wake it up, um, which is a really nice semantic, but it doesn't exist everywhere. Um, and so there are still issues with if you want to oversubscribe a node where you're running multiple threads that are you know, more threads than cores, and you want to be able to efficiently wake a thread up when a network packet arrives or a network message arrives, how do you do that? Um, there's no good way to do that now. That was one of the things that kernel-level networking actually does fairly well, but you paid the penalty of having to go through the kernel for all of that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that semantic um, because it, it relates to active messages and this idea that you can have something that's waiting, have a thread that's waiting on a message to arrive, and then when it does arrive, wake it up immediately. So 
In the mid-90s and late 90s, there were a couple of networks out there that essentially enabled us to, to do further exploration of user-level networking kinds of, uh, of, of low-level APIs. Um, so we transitioned what we were doing on MPP machines with portals into, uh, into user-level networks. Um, and the first one that we started looking at was Miranet. Um, these, these networks were somewhat different than MPP networks because MPP networks were attached to the memory bus. And again, coherent, the NIC was coherent with the memory uh, with the processors. And so um, we had a different change. We had a change now because the, the, the network interfaces were essentially stuck at the other side of an I.O. bus. So um, much harder to program because the, the network interfaces can't always see all of memory. Um, and if you're doing things like um, uh, virtual memory support where pages of memory can be moved around by the OS, that's usually not a, bad, that's usually not a good thing when your NIC uh, doesn't know where the pages are that it needs to write to. Again, we didn't have to worry about this kind of stuff on an MPP network, um, but it was uh, essentially really complicated for uh, networks that are attached to an I.O. bus. And this is still the case today. Um, if you look at the way networks work today, they're either PCI attached, very few of them are, are sitting on the memory bus. And so you have to worry about pinning pages um, and then keeping the operating system from actually moving pages around. I don't know if Ken talked about that at all or not, but that's still one of the significant issues for, for user level networks. So Miranet was really nice because you could program it. Uh, you could replace the, essentially the control program that ran on the embedded processor down in the network interface. You could implement different protocols and different things with it. Um, and it spurred a lot of research. Um, so I've listed um, a whole bunch of AP APIs there. Uh, AM was active messages, FM was fast messages, GM was Glenn's messages that came from Miracom. Um, PM, I don't think PM ever had a real name, but it was a Japanese uh, MCP that they used. Um, and then MX was essentially what Miracom moved to when they productized. Um, it was the second generation of, uh, you can think of it as a next generation GM interface. Um, and then there was Quadrix. Um, so Quadrix was a really nice network that was uh, a follow on to the to Mako MPP machines. Um, you could actually program, uh, you could as a user, uh, write uh, uh, an application that, that uh, ran a thread down on the network interface controller. Um, so they gave you a, a program, an application development environment where you could write uh, a thread that would run on the network interface card. And so again, it allowed you some flexibility in what you did with, with getting network semantics. The majority of what, what happens with low level networking layers is dealing with the semantic mismatch between what the hardware and the underlying software provide and what the upper level protocol wants to do, right? Um, so this is one of the challenges. If you get a network that doesn't quite do what you want it to do, uh, and the example that I picked here is uh, InfiniBand verbs over MPI point to point. So when InfiniBand and RDMA uh, became popular, uh, the InfiniBand folks thought, you know, this is great. We can do RDMA, which is one-sided. You can put uh, data directly from one process into, another, into a remote process. Um, so you get the, the, the nice um, uh, point of one-sided where you don't have to interrupt the other side. You don't have to do anything on the other side to receive the data. You get a zero copy transfer, which is essentially really just a single copy transfer from one process into the other process. You get very low CPU usage because the network handles the transfer. You don't have to interrupt. You don't have to have the host processor doing anything. You have a fixed amount of memory resources because you're, you've had to declare what memory is going to be involved in the transfer ahead of time. Um, and it supports all these non-blocking, you know, all the things that you really want to make networks go fast. And then as soon as you put MPI point to point on top of it, you lose all of those capabilities because MPI point to point is two-sided. And so now you've actually got to do some, some transfers of control messages between uh, over top of that RDMA to make MPI work. You've got to do matching somewhere. If InfiniBand doesn't do matching at the verbs layer, then you have to do it somewhere. Uh, and you end up having to do that in MPI. In order to do that matching, then the CPU is involved in every message. Um, you have things like unexpected messages in MPI. The, that concept doesn't exist in RDMA. And so you have to, you have to deal with that somehow. Um, so, so you get all of these great features from the underlying transport layer and the underlying network, and then you have to put something on top of it that essentially loses all of those capabilities. Um, and this was what was really frustrating with, uh, to, uh, for me and for the work that we were doing with portals. Um, we wanted underlying transport layers and hardware that would actually meet the semantics that we needed for MPI. And so we tried to do that with portals in a way that was 
not only specific to MPI, but would be generally useful for all those other upper layer protocols that I talked about. So I like to show this slide. I'm not trying to um, uh, say that the research that went on here was not valuable, but this is just evidence of a semantic mismatch <laughs> between the underlying network hardware and what MPI is trying to do. If it takes this much effort and this much research um, to make MPI work well over verbs and in Finiman, it seems like something shouldn't be, that should be wrong, right? If, if you design a network to do MPI well, you shouldn't have to write, uh, I forget what the count here is, but you know, and, and it didn't stop in 2008. Um, one of the reasons it didn't stop is because uh, Mellanox kept adding things to InfiniBand to make it work for MPI much better. Um, and I've got a slide on that as well. But this is, again, evidence of the semantic mismatch between what you'd like to have from uh, the upper layer protocols and what they want to do to what the network actually does. And you can see these all over the place. So everybody needs a network portability layer in some way, shape, or form. And so I've got um, OpenMPI and MPICH there. Uh, they have an underlying uh, abstraction layer that they use to port to multiple interfaces. Um, there's PAMI, which is an IBM product. Um, GasNet, which provides active message capability for the Berkeley UPC implementation. So this is what everybody was doing with their network APIs. And so everybody had work that they were doing with APIs for MirrorNet. Then they were showing how these APIs could meet the semantics uh, for the upper layer protocols that they needed. Um, and then they would port them to every other network, every new network that came along. And so if you bought a new MPP system or, or a new uh, network came out, you essentially would take your low-level portability API and port it to that, to that next machine. And so um, we had portals, and we were trying to get this capability in the network, but it really was, the capability wasn't in the network, it was in, the, it was in portals itself. And I was getting really frustrated because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life porting portals to whatever network came out. I wanted to stop doing that, and I wanted the network to provide that capability for me. And so we made a decision uh, to, to not make portals a portability layer or, or a low-level abstraction layer for networks. We wanted to make it something that would drive the hardware capability that we actually needed. And so people come up to me and they say, portals, I've never heard of that. I've never used that. And I say, great, because <laughs> it's, it's meant to drive the hardware capability. It's not, I don't want to spend my life porting portals uh, to, to do interconnects that come out that don't really provide the capability that we need. Um, this is going on still, uh, so um, I just threw up uh, a slide here that shows, Ken probably showed this slide, this is the, the, the latest uh, abstraction layer in MPICH. Um, don't get me wrong, you need those kind of abstraction layers. What I'm trying to do is make sure that those abstraction layers are as thin as possible, right? And so you, you still need those abstraction layers and you still need that work. Um, but I'm going to leave it up to Ken to do that kind of work, because I think that's where it should be done. Um, and then you have, uh, there's UC, UCX uh, and OFI, which are two new efforts, fairly new efforts to standardize lower level transport APIs. So this is, you know, think of it as the thing that sits underneath MPI. Um, you know, the great thing about this is, is they're trying to be portable for all the, the, the transports that sit above them. And as soon as you have two standards, you still have to have a portability layer. So, um, you're not solving any problems if you have two approaches to standards, but that's typical of standards, right? The great thing about standards is there's so many things, there's so many to choose from. Um, so this new motivation for low-level transports has been a realization that if I have an abstraction layer just in MPICH, all that does is support MPI, and so can I use that same abstraction layer for other upper layer protocols? And so people have started to realize that there are uh, opportunities to explore other programming systems and other things other than MPI out there that people want high performance networking for. Um, and so I've listed some of those things there. Um, there's a desire to reduce development costs. So if you're IBM, one of the reasons you have PAMI if you're IBM is because if you want to sell three different networks, you don't want three different teams working on MPI for those three different networks, right? You want to have one layer that you can have one software stack that targets those three layers. Um, again, this, is, this has been a complaint that we need these abstraction layers and we need these portability layers because there's a lot of effort that people use to port them, right? So this was the issue 10 years ago when you had something like MPICH that had 10 networks it had to support. 
uh, you needed a significant amount of work to do that. And everybody did that for every upper layer protocol that they wanted. And the argument there is, if you actually get the right semantics from the hardware, the porting effort shouldn't really be that hard, right? This is just another indication that, that your low-level transport is not giving you the capabilities that you want. Um, and then I'll just mention the last one, vendor differentiation. It would be nice, the vendors all came together to support MPI in some way. It would be nice if we actually came together and supported lower level network uh, APIs and mechanisms um, and not worried about whether it's UCX or, or uh, uh, lip fabric or anything like that. Just the same kind of capability would be good. So some fundamental principles. Uh, and these are, you know, this is, this is just, uh, you can apply these to more than just networking probably. Um, but more layers of software degrades performance and scalability. This has always been the thing that I've said. You don't get performance and scalability by adding more layers of software. If you did, then you could make it recursive. Yeah, OK. Um, uh, hardware almost always outperforms software. Um, so that's generally uh, uh, true. Uh, and software fixes to hardware are usually really slow. Um, and so. Uh, these are just some fundamental principles that we go by when we look at how we're doing uh, co-design for the network. So I'll just talk a little bit about Red Storm. Uh, so Red Storm was the prototype for the XT series. We worked uh, with Cray um, in 2003 on this platform. Uh, the interesting thing about this was the Cray C-Star, uh, which was a network interface and router uh, that we helped uh, Cray design. Uh, so uh, the interesting thing about uh, the C-Star that I'll mention is that it was actually a system on a chip. Um, so it was a system on a chip design uh, around an embedded power PC processor from IBM. And so Cray had um, a whole bunch of IP in hardware that they had developed for their Black Widow architecture, which was a shared global shared memory machine. Um, and when we wanted to build a distributed memory machine, we needed a new network for it. And so they looked at the pieces of, of intellectual property that they had in hardware for their existing platform, they looked at what they could get from the open market. Uh, in particular, what they needed was a hypertransport interface for the AMD Opteron processor. And so they went out and purchased IP to do that and then put it all together in the system on a chip. And so um, this was a really interesting process for us because it was the first time that we had been involved in a, in a co-design project where you could tweak things because it was a system on a chip environment. And I'm gonna come back to that because this is, uh, this is sort of coming back around. Uh, so anyway, the C-Star was pretty successful. It ran portals as its lower, lowest, level, lowest level API. Um, the thing that we like to point out about Red Storm is that Cray's, Cray had sold more of this type of, of machine than any other type of machine in their history. And so um, it was a very successful machine uh, and sold a lot of cabinets. Um, the thing I wanted to concentrate uh, a little bit on was onload versus offload. And so I, when I presented C-Star back in the 2005 timeframe, people would come up to me and say, why are you doing offload? You're making Cray spend tens of billions of dollars to develop a new ASIC. You can just dedicate a core, so take one of your host processor cores and dedicate that towards uh, networking. Uh, you know, you can, you, a three gigahertz core is gonna do networking stuff a lot faster than a 500 megahertz embedded power PC will. Um, and you're not gonna sell any of those because you're an HPC, and there's no market for HPC machines, right? Um, this is, you know, if, if I can give you some insight, um, you know, uh, high performance computing is a lot about economics. It's a little bit about a science and a lot about economics. Um, and this is one of the economic arguments is, are you really gonna sell enough C-Stars if you, if you do a, you know, a custom ASIC uh, and spend tens of millions of dollars on that, are you gonna ever, ever be able to recover that? Why don't you just dedicate a core? And we have many core chips coming along, and so the cost of actually dedicating cores is gonna go down over time because the number of cores is gonna keep increasing. And cores aren't getting any slower. They're getting faster in 2005. And then they stopped getting faster in 2007. <laughs> and so if you, look at, if you look at core speed, if you look at the clock frequency, uh, this is a well-used chart that shows you all kinds of things that are slowing down, but the clock frequencies actually started going down. And so not only are cores not getting faster, they actually got slower. And so if you were depending on your cores, which weren't designed to do networking in the first place, if you were designing, you know, depending on those to, do, to get performance for the, from a network, you're actually gonna get slower. Um, and so you saw things like Cray uh, for their next generation of, of, process, of network processor, which was the Gemini, their network uh, card. Uh, 
They didn't do matching um, in, in quite the same way that the CSTAR did. And so they needed to dedicate cores to actually get progress for MPI. And, and they were arguing against us for progress from the network. Um, and then when their next network chip came out, they actually saw the benefits of it. But they could only get it by dedicating host cores to do it. So this is just our reference implementation. Again, we have a portals for a reference implementation. This is part of our co-design activities. You can go grab it. You can download it. Um, there are uh, several uh, different upper layer transports that support it. If you go grab MPICH, you can configure MPICH to use portals. Uh, there's a Sandia Open Shmem implementation that runs over portals as well. You can grab it and play with it. Understand that it's a reference implementation. It's an extra layer of software between you and the underlying network, which is not going to give you performance or scalability. Um, that's the fundamental principle. What it does allow you to do is interesting co-design things. And so um, we've had examples of people that, like AMD, where they have a, a network simulator environment. They can put portals on top of that then and use it as, in a simulator environment to actually show how those upper layer protocols would be affected by the underlying hardware. Um, and more recently, we've actually had a company called Bull, which was bought out, bought out by Atos, go and design hardware that does portals in hardware. Um, and so if you go to supercomputing, if you've been at supercomputing in the last couple of years, you've seen it under glass. Somewhere there's a machine with this hardware and it's actually working. And at some point, uh, maybe CEA or Atos will actually tell us how well it's working. Um, but there's um, interesting things that you can do with portals as a uh, co-design layer when you build it over simulation environments. And then there's an example of an FPGA-based implementation of portals as well. The other thing I wanted to talk about was active messages. I don't know if, if Ken talked about active messages or, uh, or not. Um, it, it's uh, something that's been uh, around for a long time. Uh, so this was a, uh, a mechanism that was invented uh, in the early 90s, which was essentially, if you think about message-driven computation, it was in being able to inject a message into a network that had uh, code as well as data. And so it would end up at the target. The target would run that code on that data. Um, so it's a very nice semantic for a lot of different things. Um, the, the initial uh, active message API, I believe, was implemented on one of the Stanford uh, J machines or something like that. I'd have to ask Andrew Chen, but I think that's, that's what it was. Um, beyond, so after that, then they, they extracted that API out and they implemented it on general networking hardware like uh, MirrorNet as well. Uh, there are a couple different flavors of this. There's, there's what I think of as pure active messages where the, the, the code to be run and the data are actually combined in the message that you end up uh, arriving at the target. Um, that's kind of hard to do for uh, most networks. So what they do is they give you a, a, essentially a way to reference a function that already exists at the target to run on that data. So you'll have some index into uh, some table somewhere that will tell you what function to run on that, on that data when it arrives. Um, it's similar to a remote procedure uh, call. Uh, if you think about that, it doesn't have to return anything to the, to the calling uh, process, though. Uh, but anyway, this is a great semantic, right? Uh, can be used in a lot of places. If you think about it, things like um, if I can send a non-contiguous MPI message and have the, the code up front that essentially does the unpacking at the destination, then I don't have to worry about something at the remote side being able to know how, how to unpack that. Um, and this is good for things like uh, one-sided in MPI, where the, the data type doesn't have to exist at the target. And so I can encode how that data gets distributed at the source, um, and then the target can just run that, that uh, way to uncompress it or, or uh, unpack it. Um, so this is a great semantic. And unfortunately, it's one of the great semantics that networks have never really provided very, very well. Um, so people keep trying to get at it, um, but you can't really get at it very well. Uh, one of the reasons is data delivery. So uh, a lot of these active message APIs don't uh, standardize how you do data delivery. So do you deliver data first and then run the handler on it? Do you have the handler determine where the data ends up? Um, so there has been explorations of all these different kinds of semantics. Then the handlers that you actually run at the other side, um, when can they be called? How long do they last? What context do they run in? Do they run in the application's address space? Do they run in some interrupt context? Um, you look at all of the, the complexity of doing that, and suddenly it's, it's an easy semantic to think about. It's a great semantic to have. But then when you try to actually go implement it, you have uh, some issues that you have to try to deal with. Um, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I was never really a fan of active messages. Uh, when we were doing portals, uh, and everybody was doing this AMFMPMGM thing, I said, well, let's call portals IAM inactive messages. 
because it's just put the data over there, and you don't have to worry about any of these issues with, with handlers and things like that. Um, but again, we were trying to look at, is there something that we could do with portals to actually get this semantic? Um, can we get these semantics somehow? Um, and so uh, Torsten Heffler uh, visited, from ETH Zurich, visited Sandia um, two summers ago, and we started talking about this. How can we get active messages uh, as a semantic out of our lowest level uh, interconnect layer? If cores are getting slower because they're getting, trying to be more energy efficient, if it takes so, you know, they're, again, they're not good at doing general networking kinds of things. Um, you know, it takes them a long time to just access L3 cache. If you look at where networks are going, we're gonna have 400 gigabits per second um, networks coming fairly soon. That's a, a 64 byte message every 1.2 nanoseconds. Um, how are you gonna be able to handle that? You can't really dedicate a host processor to doing that and have a host processor be in the way when you try to get that, that functionality. Um, and so we looked at, you know, we started brainstorming, what can we do uh, to try to get uh, that kind of semantic uh, in a better way? And so what we developed was this thing called streaming processing in the network. Um, and so this was uh, a design of a network interface that would actually do what we wanted to do. Um, and so we designed uh, uh, a programming environment because what, what, we, what we basically decided was that the, uh, in the future, you're not actually gonna move data over your network with these low-level APIs. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna program the network like you program an accelerator. Like you program a GPU, a compute accelerator, you're gonna program a network accelerator. And that what the programming environment should provide you is the fundamental mechanisms to actually support that programming environment, not necessarily an API that does things for you. Um, and so we started trying to brainstorm about what, the, what that programming environment should look like and what capabilities should be in it. So spin, while it isn't active messages, because we're actually processing packets. So when a packet comes into uh, uh, off the fabric, it actually gets uh, uh, allocated to one of these packet processing engines. Um, and then you can write handlers to actually do these packet processing engines uh, for these packet processing engines. Um, so you don't invoke uh, on anything except a, a header when it arrives, um, and then a whole bunch of body packets, and those can be out of order. Uh, and then you know how many of those you're gonna get based on what's in the header. Uh, and then when all of those have arrived, then there's a uh, uh, a tail uh, handler that actually runs as well. Uh, and so we think this is a much better environment for uh, getting this kind of semantic uh, than just trying to provide it at the lowest level networking layer. Um, so what we did in this in the supercomputing paper that we wrote was we um, put together an initial design for this uh, uh, environment. Um, we had these handler processing units um, we uh, used simulation environments to actually build those. So we used the GEM5 simulator to um, build up these handler processing units. Um, again, I, I described the handlers here. Um, the idea was that the handlers are just written in standard C code. Um, you can't make any system calls. There's obviously no OS running there. Um, we wanted to develop a network ISA. So this is the, the, the low level capabilities that each of these handler processing, processing units would actually have. We put some uh, configuration into the simulation environment. So a packet shows up and gets uh, handed to a handler processing unit in one cycle. Um, we based a lot of what we did in the simulation environment off of previous packet processor handlers that had been built. So um, Intel, for example, used to, used to have an, a processor called the IXP. Um, and the IXP was all about doing packet processing because it was designed to do, um, uh, it, was in, it was designed for Ethernet switches. Um, and so none of, this, none of the capability that we put in the simulation environment and, and that we were thinking of uh, was you know, too far from our imagination because it was stuff that had already been built. Um, and so then we put some constraints around the programming environment, how you would actually program these. The interesting thing about this is if you go look at uh, things like the, the Mellanox Bluefield NIC now that has a whole bunch of ARM cores on it, it looks a lot like what we um, put into this design. And we're expecting more hardware specialization in HPC. Um, and so this sort of fits along the lines of, um, if you look at uh, the figure on the left there is uh, an SOC environment for um, a cell phone, I believe, a smartphone. Uh, the one on the right is the Apple A8 system on a chip. Uh, the thing that I'm trying to point out here is that um, there's a whole bunch of specialization 
that's been put into these system on a chip environments. So um, if you look at what Apple does in terms of video encoding and, and MP3 decoding and stuff like that, they're able to build system on a chip to do that. And the capabilities for doing this now are uh, getting much better. Um, and so there are people in HPC that are looking at, can we leverage the SOC environment to actually do these kind of things? Not unlike what we did with the C-Star in, in 2003, which is build up a network interface out of a, uh, a, a power PC embedded processor. Um, so there are a lot of people that think um, this, is gonna this is gonna take off. Um, there's uh, efforts to do open source hardware. So this is a, a slide I stole from John Schauf talking about uh, comparing the rise of Linux and open source software to what's going on now with open source hardware. So there are efforts to actually make it easier uh, to, to design hardware. There was a recent talk at the Salishan conference by uh, DARPA, things that they're doing uh, in terms of research to enable open source hardware. Um, so they are trying to make it much easier uh, to uh, design hardware and then actually fab it. Um, and the, you know, all of the tools that you need to do validation verification for hardware, uh, they're trying to improve and make easier. That's basically all I had. These are all the people that contributed to that. Happy to take questions. I know that was kind of a high level, kind of a low level. I bounced all over the place. But if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you.